National Fishermen and Pacific Marine Expo are proud supporters of the Galley Stories podcast, as we make similar efforts to highlight the people and topics that define commercial fishing. You can see what that looks like in print and online all year long, as well as every November in Seattle when this community comes together at PME. Check out nationalfisherman.com and pacificmarineexpo.com to learn more. Big news here at Galley Stories, guys. We have a sponsor, Alaskan Brewing Company out of Juneau, Alaska. These guys have been crafting amazing beers since 1986. First ones were all hand-packed, and all of them are either flown out or taken by sea. No roads. And of course, that's where our connection comes in. At Galley Stories, we're all about history and connections, and these guys have done it by staying in their community. I know that many of you have seen Alaskan Brewing Company's products in stores or at your local watering hole. Alaskan Brewing Company, the official beer of Galley Stories. Hello guys, welcome to another installment of Galley Stories, Stories of the Bering Sea and Beyond. I am your host, Mark Kaver. Today we've got a 40 year of experience cook with us, which we haven't had uh, a cook. We have had a couple people that cooked, but not for their entire careers. Uh, Larry Carroll, Larry, thanks for joining us today. Hey, how's it going, Mark? Good, good. So what got you into the fishing industry or what was your introduction to it? I imagine you had the kitchen background first. Yeah, I started out, I was uh, about 14 years old, and my friend's dad was a chef at 13 Coins Restaurant in Seattle. I was still pretty young, obviously I shouldn't have worked, but it, I started working as a dishwasher and on Saturdays and Sundays while I was going to school. And they, the chef left a, a, a recipe in the back kitchen of the, of the restaurant. While I was washing dishes, I read this recipe and started making this spaghetti sauce. It was like a, I don't know, 50 gallon pot of spaghetti sauce. I didn't know that I wasn't supposed to do that. Well, he came back at, like after the lunch rush and realized I'd made the spaghetti sauce. And next thing I know, within a couple of weeks, I became a cook. And my dad was, you know, retired Navy, so I always wanted to be uh, to go to sea. So I applied for a job with NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. It took me about two years of applying. I finally got uh, got hired. I was as I had a opportunity to either be a junior quartermaster, which is up in the wheelhouse doing charts and, and you know navigational stuff, or a second cook. The second I took the second cook's position because A, I was already cooking, and number two, it had a, about a $3,000 more base pay per year. And back in those days, that was in 1979, that was a lot of money. So but looking back, if I had went the other way, I would have probably been a captain many, many years ago. But as it was, it, it led me to where I ended up today. So, How was that first experience? What was your quarters like? What was the experience itself? Um, how many people were on board? Uh, I, my first job was second cook on a NOAA ship Rainier. It was a 221-foot hydrographic survey boat, which is making charts, depths of the charts of the oceans. <clears throat> um, so we left Seattle. I was I just turned 19, I think. Left Seattle, and we went up the Inside Passage. We were, he we were going to Anchorage, Alaska. It was my first time at sea. And for about three or four days, I thought, well, this is really easy. You know, you, you just cook. There's, there's 50 people on the boat. There's 10 people in the stewards department. So we have a chief steward, a steward, two chief cooks, a second cook, a baker, and like four messmen, so there's plenty of people to, to cater to the, the crew. But after like the third, almost the fourth day, we had to go out into open waters. We left Dixon entrance and there was a storm. And so we were, I remember we were serving lasagna that night. And as soon as I was starting to clean up from dinner, the boat started rocking and rolling and I see pots and pans were hanging from the, in the galley with, off of hooks swinging back and forth and banging into each other and next thing I know I'm in my bunk seasick for 36 hours until we hit uh, Sitka. When we landed in Sitka, Alaska I had a choice to make. I walked on the dock. I started calling home. I called my wife because I was just young. I got married young. I called my wife and she says well you can't come home. We don't have any money for airfare so you just got to stuff tough it out. Called my mom and dad Ryan, please, just I want to come home. I, I don't think I like this. And my dad got on the phone and told me all the years he was in the Navy and said, look, just, just you'll be fine. I, it happens to everybody. So I was kind of stuck. I didn't have no option. 
So I ended up going back on the boat, and then I ended up, that turned into about an eight year career with the federal government. And then from there is where I went to commercial fishing, and that's a whole different. You just gonna keep talking? Yeah, how did, okay. you, how did okay. you progress? <clears throat> so I worked for NOAA for about eight years as a second cook, worked my way up to chief steward, and along the, along the way I switched boats because I uh, I had a little problem. There's a bunch of girls on a boat and I was married and I couldn't uh, couldn't keep doing the right thing. So they decided to give me a promotion and put me on a small boat. It was the NOAA ship John Cobb, 96 foot wood 96 foot wooden boat with um, a crew of four guys, no women, so I couldn't get in trouble. And that's where I met a lot of guys from National Marine Fisheries. And one guy in particular, Brady, uh, I can't remember his last name, Brady something. He worked for NIMPS, National Marine Fisheries. He was telling me about a company that he was starting with another friend of his. He was quitting his job with the, with the, the fisheries department. And it was going to be a, a uh, factory trawler catching Pollock and making surimi up in the Bering Sea. And this was in 1986, I think is when, 80, 86, early 87. Um, it was the, the company was called Alaska Troll Fisheries, and it was the FT Endurance. Um, anyway, the boat was being built in Korea, and this was during the, uh, the Olympics that year were held in Korea. And so I was supposed to go to Korea, meet the boat, help design the galley, because I, I had quit my government job to come work for Alaska Troll Fisheries. Anyway, so I got back to Seattle, there's no real job for me yet because the boat's not finished quite yet. So their intentions were to send me to Korea, help design the galley, and bring the boat back to Seattle to provision it, get crew, and head north. Well, during there was a riots in Seoul, Korea, so they couldn't send me over there. They put a, a something where nobody could fly into Korea th during this time. So they ended up paying me, I think they were paying me a $1,000 a week retainer for... It was about six months probably. Every Friday they call me, come on down, get your check. And I just didn't feel right collecting money for not doing anything. It just didn't seem right to me. So interim, I decided to apply with a company called Arctic Alaska Seafoods. And that again, it was probably about a six month process. I, I think I spent almost a year with Alaska Troll Fisheries collecting a check. And I would go into personnel at Arctic Alaska at least every couple of weeks and just touch bases and see what was going on. And this particular day, it was a Friday. I walked into the office and Willie Dodd, the personnel manager was at the counter. And I asked him, Hey, any, any progress on any cook openings on any of your factory trawlers? He says, well, how soon can you be to Alaska? I said, well, I, how soon do you need me? He says, how's tomorrow? I said, well, I guess I, you know, if that's what it is. So I got hired on the U S enterprise, which was a, 220, I think a 221 foot factory trawler it was one of the very first uh, Serini boats where we would catch Pollock, fillet the Pollock, mince it, put it in these mixers and extruders and it would come out of paste like toothpaste. But it was one of the first Serini trawlers. Okay. Um, so, and I really didn't know what kind of money I was gonna make I left my government job, it was probably $30,000 a year back then, this was in 1987, which was, you know, it was okay money, but I didn't know what kind of money I'd make, I just knew I was going to get a cruise share. Well, the boat had already been up in Alaska for close to a year now, and nothing was working properly, the factory would break down, about the time they got the factory figured out, the main engine, one main engine would go, would, would break down, or the water makers, there's always something. And as luck would have it, I got on the boat, made the first successful trip that boat had made. We went out and we were out for probably 10 days, heading into Dutch Harbor. Uh, still, I'm the cook, I'm cooking for 50 people. I don't have any assistants, I don't, just all by myself in the galley. The captain called me to the wheelhouse and uh, he said, bring your contract up, I wanna see what, you're, what they signed you up at in Seattle. So I grabbed the pink piece of paper I had in my locker, brought it up because I didn't know what it meant. 
and he opened it up and said, oh, they signed you up at 0.5%. That's a half a, a half a percent. He says, you're much better cooked than that. I'm going to sign you up at 0.95%, which was just about a full percent. Again, I didn't know what that meant. So he just told me, he said, well, here's the deal. We just did the record trip. Ten days, we filled the boat up. And that was 27,000 cases of Serini, 44-pound cases. And back in that day, there was only three grades of Serini, A, AA, and AAA, I believe. And it was, I still remember, it was $1.35 a pound. And so when you extrapolated the numbers, I still, in my mind, I figured, well, maybe I made a couple thousand dollars in 10 days. I really wasn't sure. But when the captain, he grabbed his calculator real quick, and as the math was, it was just a little bit under $20,000. And I could not believe I made that kind of money in 10 days. Because really, this was going to be a maybe one-year, two-year job. And then I was going to probably go back and work on the beach and the restaurants. So, needless to say, I was hooked. That was big money. And I continued fishing on the U.S. Enterprise for about five years. And I worked a two-month on, two-month off. Uh, rotation with another cook, Harold Powell. Says, well, the crew started really, they liked me because I was a little bit easier of a cook. When the guys, you know, the rule on a fishing boat is no no rain gear in the wheel, in the house, meaning the interior of the vessel, not, not in the factory. Well, you know, these guys are working 16 hours a day without hardly any breaks. They're cold, they're wet, they're hungry. Occasionally, I'd let a deckhand run down the galley to grab a cup of coffee or a cookie, or I'd meet him at the factory door with a donut or something because, you know, I'm inside. I'm wearing an apron, you know, some cut-off extra tough boots so I don't slide all around, and, and I, you know, really, I just feel bad for these guys, so I tried to accommodate them the best I could. So the crews started taking a liking to me, and so it ended up where... At, a, at one point, where most of the guys that were in rotation, whether they be in the factory or on deck, would always tell the personnel officer, look, I'm not going up until Larry goes up. So I had kind of a following. So then I ended up, so other boats would, would, the two months that I wasn't up in Alaska, another boat, one of the cooks would get sick or hurt or have a family emergency. So they would call me and, and uh, I'd go up and do a two week trip in the middle of my off time. And so I got to know a lot of the captains and a lot of the other crew members. And uh, so I just, I, I was with Arctic Alaska for quite a while, making pretty good money and working about six months a year. Okay, here we are. So anyways, that was, uh, that was what I did for, for about four or five years. Uh, I would fill in on some of the other company boats. Um, then there was a, uh, it was December 22nd, 1988. I remember that we were in a storm. We were traveling, running to the fishing grounds. We had an inexperienced first mate that I think it might have been his first trip as a first mate. <clears throat> and we were traveling, it was a three, 400 mile run up towards St. Paul Island. So he, he was a pretty inexperienced. His name was Bart Harris. So it was, it was around midnight. I went to my estate room. I, I was the cook and then the, the, uh, the deck boss, not actually factory foreman, Dan Dietrich, was my roommate. He was on the bottom bunk. I was on the top bunk. I remember laying in my rack and we were hitting some probably 25, 30 foot seas. It was pretty rough that night. And... I remember telling Dan, I go, God, I just wish this thing would just break in half so we could be done with this rocking around. I no sooner said that, and the boat literally felt like it was standing up, straight up and down. And then about two seconds later, I could feel the boat teeter down the other way, bow down into the water, straight up and down. And then a big, loud bang, and water started gushing in through my vents above my bunk. We couldn't get out of our stateroom because the door, the boat had been bent. It jarred our stateroom door shut. So then I, look, I, I get on my deck and there's water standing on the, on the deck of the stateroom. I can't get out of our room. And uh, at this point I figured, well, we're going down, we're gonna sink. I didn't really know what was happening. And 
Thank God the chief engineer had a fire axe and he broke, in, broke the door open, got us out of our stateroom. Um, I went running up to the wheelhouse. Of course, we blew out four or five windows. Come to find out that was an 80 foot road wave that hit us and it just came out of nowhere and we were traveling probably seven, eight knots, way too fast for the weather conditions. Was this, which vessel was this? That was on the U.S. Enterprise. Okay, so yeah, still, yep, yeah. Okay. December 22nd, 1988, I'll never forget because I remember thinking my two girls back home, they were just babies that, you know, dad's not coming home, Merry Christmas. And we were able to to get the get the vessel and save it, you know, where was water coming in the windows, but uh, we had a really good captain. Of course, he ran up to the wheelhouse in his underwear because he was sleeping when this happened. And I remember um, I went around and woke up most of the crew, got them in their survival suits, got everybody ready to go. And I remember it was, it was one I should have been really, really scared because I really thought we were going in the water. And we were 300 miles from anybody. We had, at this point, because of the water coming in the wheelhouse, we had no electronics, no radios, no Lorans. We had no way of contacting anybody. All we had was a compass and a main engine that was still running. Um, I was really calm. And I don't know if that was God or what that was, but I was able to go around, make sure everybody was up in their survival suits, calm, getting ready to get, you know, to, to throw over the lifeboats and get ready to get in the water. And we were able to turn the boat around, get it out of the, get the swell coming to the stern, the back of the boat. And then we had uh, cut some plywood, filled the wheelhouse windows. And again, we didn't have any radios. We had no no uh, navigational. All we had was a compass. And it's steering, even the, the steering had to steer from the, the chief engineer had to go back in the after steering back where the rudder is and manually steer the boat with the VHF radio handheld up to the wheelhouse to make it back to Dutch Harbor only on a compass. And that took us about three days uh, and we got into Dutch Harbor and they, they, I figured I was almost at my two month point. So I figured I'd go home, maybe get home for Christmas because now it's almost Christmas day by the time we got into Dutch Harbor. Well, they tried getting a hold of the other cook and of course he didn't answer his phone. So I had to go back out after we plugged the windows with, we had some steel plates cut. We went back out with four of our windows missing and steel plates. We looked like a like a uh, warship at this point. <clears throat> um, so we went back out and finished the trip and, and everybody survived. Nobody was, nobody was hurt. Um, you didn't have people that just refused to go back out after that? You know, as I recall, I don't, you know, I, I don't know if we lost anybody or not. I don't think we did. We had a pretty seasoned crew. We may have lost a few that, you know, just refused to go back out. I, I don't remember, but Seems to me like everybody stayed on the boat, mm -hmm. as, as I can recall. But uh, it was uh, it was really a, a you know it was quite quite a deal. I, it was something that not everybody experiences, and hopefully nobody has to experience because it's it's a uh, it's pretty dangerous. So you know, generally I ask someone what's their what's the scariest time they've had at sea, but you expressed that you didn't you weren't really scared. You were calm. I there had to be moments of fear, I'm sure. Oh, absolutely. At first, it was it was probably more shock than anything. But um, I knew that it was a it was a seaworthy boat. I knew we had a really good chief engineer. I knew the captain was good. Um, and I just I, I, like I said, it might have been God. I don't know. But I, I felt I felt calm. I wasn't really really worried. But that was probably the the worst thing that's ever happened at sea, as far as I can remember. I've had lots of incidences. Many times where guys have cut a finger off or cut their foot halfway off. And of course, when you're a cook on a, on a factory boat, you're usually the medic too. You're usually the one that does the patching up guys and stitching them or whatever it happens to be. So and that was, uh, I've, I've seen lots of guys, like I say, cut their fingers off, um, you name it. And so then Article Alaska started putting me on other boats when they, when they needed fill-ins, you know, when guys were sick or whatever. I, I made a, two or three trips on, I fished on the, the Gulf Wind, 
king crab, red king crab, and I think Opelio, I did probably three or four trips on the Gulf, the Gulf wind. Then I went, uh, I think I went to Seattle for a couple weeks and they called me to go up on the Pacific wind. I went up crabbing on that boat for probably a month. Then Arctic Alaska brought out the big brand new factory trawler, the biggest one. This, this one was the biggest one in the Bering Sea at the time. It was in 1990, I believe, it was the Island Enterprise. This was a 300 and, I think 314 foot factory trawler crew of about 70 people. And of course I raised my hand for that job because it was a, you know, it paid more money. It was on a bigger boat. I had my own stateroom with my own shower, my own office. It was, it was pretty neat. What I didn't realize was that boat was, was a, was a very dangerous right out of the gate. It was a, it was made, it was a converted freighter. And they, down in Mississippi, they took it to the shipyard, took, bought an old freighter, stretched it. I don't believe they widened it. They stretched it and built the wheelhouse and the, the, all the other decks above the freight deck. So it was pretty top heavy. I remember it, it looked kind of weird because I think the wheelhouse was probably 40 feet above the water on a boat that I think only had a, I don't remember the beam, but it was pretty narrow. So. Anyways, I, I took that job and I was on the boat the first time we we left Seattle in I think we we're going up for a season in this was in 1990 and In Seattle we had a bunch of you know Temporary workers welders and whatnot and a lot of people were offered jobs on the boat Well before we left Seattle they did drug tests on everybody This is when they started doing that and a couple of people probably didn't make it through so somebody had tipped off the, I don't know if it was a DEA or somebody. So when the boat was leaving Seattle to go to Dutch Harbor, when we hit the dock, OSI dock in Dutch Harbor, we had this, they had the uh, local police department there, the DEA, the Coast Guard, immigration, and I think it was one of the, they were all this law enforcement and they, as soon as the boat tied up, they bum rushed the boat, came into the galley, brought everybody into the galley. All the crew members had to meet in the galley. And they took us from the galley to the warehouse, the OSI warehouse, like 10 people at a time, at gunpoint, because the boat was basically under siege at that time. Somebody had called and said we were carrying a bunch of drugs or whatever, transporting them up to Dutch Harbor, which wasn't true. But they had to do their due diligence and search stateroom one by one, get the drug sniffing dogs. And so they took, I think it was 55, 60 of us into the warehouse in Dutch Harbor. For several hours, we were sitting there while they were searching the boat. After about two or three hours, two of the Coast Guard guys came and got me and they were both carrying guns. And they said, hey, we need you back to the boat. So I didn't know what that meant. And they said, well, you're the cook. We're going to, you know, you got to get these guys some Kool-Aid and some cookies or some candy or something because they're going to be in the warehouse a lot longer and you're hungry. So we, I gathered up a bunch of stuff, brought it back to the warehouse. Same thing happens a couple hours later. They came and got me again. And I said, okay, well, great. I get a little break, get some more donuts or cookies or make some sandwiches. This time they decided to arrest me because the, the dog they had, the DEA dog, happened to like my stateroom, which was right next to the galley. Well, I, I didn't do drugs. I had just done a drug test before I left Seattle. I had no drugs on me. My captain, which was Jeff Boddington, knew me and knew that I was not a drug addict and didn't have any drugs. They arrested me, took me to, to the uh, police station in Dutch Harbor, and they continued, then they tore my room apart. They took my sink out, they took the pipes underneath my sink, they pulled all the lockers apart, the lockers away from the walls, had my mattress cut open. Um, they couldn't find anything, and I guess what happened was when the boat was being built in, I think it was Louisiana or Mississippi, <clears throat> some of the shipbuilders probably used my stateroom because it was right next to the galley where they would go in to get their coffee and they were probably smoking marijuana in my room. It's the only thing I can think because maybe it permeated the wood lockers. So Jeff Waddington, my captain, had to come into town and bail me out and went back to the boat. We started, you know, then back to business as usual. We we're backloading all of our 
sugar and fiber for the, the, it was a serene boat. So we had all these products we had to carry with us. And I remember leaving Dutch Harbor finally a few days later. We got our first bag of fish, which was about 120 tons. I don't know if you get, anybody knows that, but it's a big, long, looks like a big sock full of fish, 120 tons of pollock. And uh, Captain Jeff Boddington brought it up onto the trawl deck, which was probably 25, 30 feet above water. As soon as he got the bag of fish on deck, the boat leaned over, I don't know how many degrees, but it was literally almost sideways. You could dip your hand on the, on the port side and put it in the water. Well, that we thought we were gonna roll over because the boat seemed very, very top heavy and not, not very stable. So the chief engineer, uh, Eddie Bachmeyer, he, the captain wired down to him to immediately start transferring fuel and water as much as you can to the other side of the boat to try and right itself, and that didn't work. Actually, I think Eddie hit the wrong button and started transferring fuel to the side that we were leaning, the list, so it made it even worse. Once he figured that out, he started transferring the other way, and then the captain, Jeff Boddington, took the boat and started going around in circles the opposite way so it would start leaning back over. We finally got the boat righted. Interim, the Coast Guard had been called because we put out, you know, we put out a, a, a not a mayday, but a, a, because we could have been in some trouble. So the Coast Guard came out, checked the boat out, made us go back to Dutch Harbor. And then when we got to Dutch Harbor, the Coast Guard did a couple of uh, stability tests in town. I don't remember how they did it, but they did a couple of mini tests and said the boat's not safe for, for fishing. So they uh, basically told us cease and desist. We could not fish. We had to take the boat back to Seattle and uh, do something to correct the stability. So they had most of the crew, they flew a lot of the crew home. I, uh, me being the cook, of course I stayed on the boat. I think me, Jeff Boddington, the captain, the first mate, maybe 10 other people rode the boat back home. Um, I, I wasn't scared of riding the boat home because I knew with an empty, with the, without having product on deck and full fuel tanks and water tanks, we were, we were sitting pretty good in the water, so I didn't worry about that. But So their, their way of correcting it in Seattle was to sacrifice one of the fuel tanks. Instead of widening the boat, which they should have done, put a little more, more you know, metal on the stern and maybe widen it and lower the, the center of gravity, they took one fuel tank, I don't remember how many gallons, 40, 50,000 gallons of fuel, and filled it with, uh, I believe it's called magnetite. It's like a liquid, liquid lead, if you would. It pours in like a milkshake, and I think it weighs like 100 pounds per gallon. So they put, I, I don't know how much it weighed, but I remember the boat, when they, when they filled this tank, it took a couple of months to, you know, do all their, their surveys to figure out what, how much weight they needed to put in it. And I remember we did a sea trials in December. And of course, we just had a skeleton crew to go out and run it up into the Straits of Juan de Fuca out by the coast of Washington. And I remember going out, and, and I rode the boat up when it was new, so I knew how it felt, how it rode. But we were going out in the Straits of Juan de Fuca and probably... 10, 12 foot seas, not, nothing, nothing out of the ordinary at all. But I could feel the boat was really, really heavy. It didn't ride up in the swell. It just kind of cut through it and had a really weird shake. It kind of like felt like it was flexing and bending, but it wouldn't lift out of the swell. It just didn't feel right to me. So I went up in the wheelhouse and told my captain, it was Jeff Boddington, I said, Jeff, I, I, I know we're leaving next week, but I don't want to ride the boat up to Dutch Harbor. I'll fly up. I don't want to ride up. I don't. I, something's wrong with this boat. And of course, he teased me. He said, "Oh, come on, you know, you're fine." But he let me fly up, and I flew up to Dutch Harbor. A couple weeks later, when the boat was in town, got on a boat. We went out to make our first trip, and I remember the Island Enterprise. The bow was way, way. This was a 320 something foot boat. You couldn't see the bow from the wheelhouse because they had a couple of stepped down from the wheelhouse to the deck forward of the wheelhouse, and then it stepped down again, and it had a pretty small bow. But I remember we, we made our first trip, and when we came back into port, I was probably the first guy off the boat, being the cook, I had to go get the order provisions and whatnot. And as I walked around the front of the vessel, 
I could see the bow was was uh, bent in. It looked like it like we ran into a brick wall. The whole front the bow was bent straight up. And at that point, I realized this this boat's dangerous. I don't want to go back on it. So I told Jeff, "Look, fly me home or whatever. I'm not going back out on this boat." And I ended up going back to the U.S. Enterprise, and and the boat ended up fishing for many years after that. But I just didn't want to be a part of it. I didn't feel safe on that boat. And that's the only boat of all my years that I didn't really feel safe. What, uh, well, you're, 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 you're a good storyteller. Um, <laughs> what, what do you think your best time at sea has been? We've heard some, some rough times. What do you think the, the best time? The best time at sea for me was probably, <clears throat> I mean, there were times when I worked for NOAA, that was a government job. That was fun, but the commercial fishing was in my heart. What was really what I what my whole thing was about. So as far as commercial fishing, my best time ever was in the early '90s. When I first started fishing Pollock, we'd fish year round. We never caught the quota. There wasn't enough boats, and there was enough quota. Well, in the early '90s, '91, '92, they started giving us seasons: A season and B season, and we were catching the quotas. And so they brought on this new fishery in Northern California. We were one of the first factory trawlers to go down to Eureka, California and go fish a Pacific whiting. So I was one of the, one of the first guys to go do that. And uh, boy, we weren't very popular because Eureka, California is a small little, I think it's their, their biggest product is used to be marijuana. And a couple of small catcher boats that fish Pollock, or not Pollock, but hake or, or whiting for the shore plants. So all of a sudden a factory trawler comes down in their territory and we fished for hake for probably three weeks maybe. And we ended up shutting down their whole fishery. We caught their whole year's quota in about three weeks. So we weren't very popular, but <clears throat> it was nice because it was in, you know, you're fishing in 70 degree weather. You've got radio, you can listen to local radio. I mean, we're out laying on deck during, during between you know, our shifts. And so it was, it was a fun time and, and we had a lot of fun. The crew was a bunch of good people. So that was probably the best times of my, my career. Awesome. Uh, what has fishing given to you? It's given me a, 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 I think the biggest thing fishing has given me more than money or anything else is I've got some friends that I fish with that you know, and I've done other things other than fishing, and I've got a lot of friends, but my fishermen friends are friends for life. Friends that, if they ever come, I live in Arizona now, if they're ever in town, they're always welcome at my house. They're always welcome to stay. Uh, and I think likewise, if wherever I travel, any friends that are fished with, or, so you become kind of a brother. People don't quite understand that work at a regular job, that you live with these people more than you do your own family. So. That's probably the, the biggest thing I've taken from fishing is the friendships that have lasted decades and decades. In fact, I quit fishing many, many years ago and got into the car business, but I've always had my fingers in because I would go up and do charters every now and then, and I still stay in contact with all the guys I fished with back in the, in the late 80s. What has it taken away from you, fishing? Uh, two marriages. <laughs> But I'm on number three now, 18 years in, and it's the best thing that's ever happened to me. So I would say it's uh, taken away a couple of marriages. And my two daughters, my I have three children. My oldest daughter is one's 43, the other's 41. I was away a lot when they were younger, so I didn't have as close a relationship as I do with my youngest, my 27-year-old son. But um, that's just the life of a fisherman. What would you suggest to young young folks that are looking to get into the industry? Uh, right now, I would say don't because it's pretty, pretty tough, but it's very rewarding. And I, I, right now, there's a lot of closures and, and whatnot going on, but I think it'll come back around. And, you know, if you like to have time off and make good money and do something you're proud of and stories that'll be with you for life, because these are stories I carry with me for life that are, are near and dear to my heart and stuff that you don't get if you just work at a regular job. So I would say if it's in your heart, give it a try. It's, it's definitely, uh, it's lucrative. Well, okay, Larry, I really appreciate you taking the time to come out. And I know that you've been an avid listener. 
as well. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. But at this time, do you, do you have any other final words you want to say or even additional stories you'd like to share? Whatever. You know, I, I, I can't think of anything. All I can say is that fishing has given me a, a, a lot of good times, a lot of, you know, lost a couple of marriages, but uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, I can't think of anything else that's off the, off the cuff. I mean, I just, it, it, it's given me my life and a lot of good friends and I thank everybody for that and I, you know, kind of feel bad for my family that I was away a lot and, and that, but it's just, I did what I had to do, so. Okay. Well, thanks for taking the time to come out and share it today. You're welcome. So, all right, guys, uh, that's going to be it, and we will see you next time. Thanks for listening to Galley Stories. We hope you like what the net brought in. Please leave us a review on iTunes, whether you like it or not. We're not fishing for compliments. Look us up on Facebook and Twitter, too. And reach out to us at galleystories at gmail.com.